Welcome to the Titans of Industry show. We're doing a special interview today uh, with the one and only Gregor Gregerson uh, from uh, Silver Bullion, a great friend of ours, and he's a precious metals dealer and a fold storage operator and owner out of Singapore. And now they've added another key product, which is holding your crypto keys with them, which we'll uh, talk about later in the interview. We're, do we're going to have a great chat. I'm personally going to start storing with them uh, real soon. So if you're looking to put some precious metals into your portfolio in Asia, this might interest you very much. Gregor, how are you today? Oh, very good. Thank you for having me. Gregor, thanks for being here. Uh, I have some important questions for you today since uh, you're merging two separate worlds in, in your storages um, based on the same premise. Many around the globe are fearful of government mandated currencies, the fiat currencies, and are either buying precious metals or cryptocurrencies as ways of storing transactional value outside the banking system. Gold, obviously, and silver being the more stable and historically recognized uh, means of savings. And the new digital assets, such as uh, Bitcoin, on the flip side, uh, as experimental and new. Uh, one being a physical commodity, the other purely digital, with uh, Jeff Gunlach and uh, Ray Dalio, two world experts on bonds, calling for a sustained bond bear market and calling for inflation and the need to own precious metals uh, and, and positioning in it, it themselves. What are your customers telling you today? Are they, uh, are they picking up their own demand? Well, a lot of our customers, they tend to buy gold as a way to protect themselves against the systemic crisis. So um, when interest rates go up, then, you know, typically you would expect gold to be going down. Uh, but in our case, I think customers really like to see gold as a diversification out of equities to some degree, uh, because a lot of people are starting to get a bit nervous with equities, you know, hitting new highs all the time. And we've had quite a lot of people actually switch from cryptocurrency into gold recently. So last year we saw a, a flow from gold into crypto, and right now we're seeing people coming back into gold. So that's the relationship uh, that we're seeing between crypto and gold. And when it comes to um, moving forward, from our point of view, it's very much based on uh, you know how worried people are for the future. So. Uh, if we are going to see the biggest correlations that we are seeing is when the stock market is going to start heading south, uh, a lot of people are probably going to start going into gold and seeking refuge. How does your company ensure precious metals holdings? You're in Singapore, a Singapore, a Singaporean uh, incorporated company. Many people put their gold in, in their homes or in a safe or in, at the deposit box at the bank or stored within their own jurisdiction. How does owning in Singapore create an advantage? Yes, uh, you know, those are some very good points. I would say one, one, one thing I always recommend people is it, it does make sense for you to own some gold yourself, you know, have it in your safe, have it handy. But at the same time, you know, once you start uh, having some more assets, uh, it also makes a lot of sense to diversify some of these assets and put it in another jurisdiction. And there are several jurisdictions out there, Switzerland and Singapore oftentimes the most uh, popular recently. Now, the reason why Singapore is such a good jurisdiction is essentially, A, it's, it's a very rich country. So uh, it is very unlikely that they're going to uh, have to nationalize gold or have a currency crisis or something like that. Uh, but more importantly, all of that rich, uh, that wealth, is coming from, uh, as the Singapore government so, government so summarized it, confidence. In other words, Singapore does not have oil, Singapore does not have natural resources. All of the wealth is coming from the fact that it's a very, very well-run government. Um, there is virtually no corruption, it has one of the uh, best legal systems and so on. Uh, so a lot of Western companies will come here, a lot of investors put their money here. Uh, in a part of the world, meaning Asia, where oftentimes, you know, people are a bit worried about the government, Singapore is sort of that standout place. And more importantly, because it is this way, if Singapore were ever to do something that puts that trust into question, they would basically uh, kill their economy. So 
you have a wealthy place which has a lot to gain by by not doing things such as nationalizations or similar sort of things. And we had a lot of cases in the past where Singapore uh, does stand up to pressure on, on things. You know, I always like to tell the story about um, uh, so it was this kid from, from the US which came to Singapore and he spray painted a, a bunch of cars. Uh, McFay, I think it was the name. And he got uh, arrested. Cars are very expensive here. So, um, uh, so when when he got arrested, he actually was sentenced to three strokes of the cane. And, you know, I was living in the US back then. I remember half the country was saying uh, Singapore was a barbaric place. As a half was saying, well, it's actually not a bad idea. We would have a lot of less graffiti. But the point of the story is, uh, his dad was quite a high-ranking dip- U.S. diplomat, and it became a national issue. Went all the way to Bill Clinton, actually calling the White House uh, equivalent in Singapore, and say, "Just send that kid back to us." And Singapore said, uh, "Mr. President, if if we were to do that, how do we explain to our people that you know the laws don't apply if you have a rich daddy or a you know powerful daddy?" So, you know, he got his three strokes of the cane and then he was sent back. And, you know, I would think just about every country out there would pretty much have followed the, the uh, request from a U.S. president. Singapore did not. And uh, having said that, most people don't realize Singapore is also a very well defended uh, uh, country. It's, it's, its army actually was trained by Israel originally. Uh, they have pretty similar to Switzerland in that they have a national uh, two and a half year uh, national service. Uh, you have to go back two weeks every year and they have an army of up to 950,000 troops. They even have an armaments industry. So they're selling uh, amphibious assault vehicles to the US Marines, among other things. So Singapore is, is much more than a little city state. It's, it's really a, a medium sized military power as well. So it, it's basically a place, a place that is very well run. Um, it's very rich, not because of resources, but because of well management. And it has a lot to lose to um, do some things that would go against the interest of people storing wealth there. So these are more or less say, say why Singapore is a good location. And if I might add one thing, if you are storing uh, gold or silver in Singapore, uh, you have to not just look that you're physically storing it in Singapore, but you have to look at who's storing it for you. Because in this industry, a lot of uh, dealers will outsource storage to large international vault operators. And these operators, you know, are are oftentimes U.S.-based companies or have a lot of exposure to the U.S. So if the U.S. were to nationalize gold or silver, uh, it is very likely that gold would go right back to the U.S., regardless where it is stored. So one thing that sets us apart is, like you mentioned, we are just a Singaporean company, we have no international exposure of any material uh, type. And that's basically what allows our customers to get purely Singaporean jurisdictional uh, exposure and not exposure to uh, back to the US or Europe. How many of the customers prefer silver to gold within your own client base? Right now we're storing around 200 tons of silver and by a value it's around 50-50 50-50 by value, which is quite unusual because typically vaults will have 90% gold and 10% silver or 95% gold. So uh, as our name says, I've always liked silver very much and uh, I guess that has rubbed off on our customers. Are your customers of the opinion that silver is still a monetary metal and not just an industrial metal? The, re- the reason I'm asking this is because in normal times we see silver trading right around uh, the production cost, but when inflation was an issue in 2011, it traded well above its production cost. Do you see returning to those premium levels again? Oh, definitely, because what we've seen uh, in the last nine years, we had three episodes when we had a lot of shortages of silver. Uh, you have to understand that the silver market is so much smaller than the gold market, and silver is so cheap compared to gold. We, we're just hitting new all-time or new lows at about 80 to 1 between the gold and silver ratio. So with a relatively small amount of money, you can buy out uh, a lot of the physical silver supply. And that basically means that it's quite 
quite volatile. Uh, when people start buying it, uh, you end up with shortages very quickly in this industry. And what happens in these cases is the silver price might actually not be going up because the silver price itself tends to be set on the future exchanges, but you're getting a lot of physical shortages. And so the premium that you have to pay to get physical silver uh, goes way up. And as far as its demand, uh, I definitely see silver and our customers see it as a precious metal, just like gold. Um, but it is something which is very cheap compared to gold. I mean, the natural ratio between gold and silver is around 16 to 1 uh, in nature, and yet the price is 80 to 1 uh, right now. Uh, furthermore, about half of our worldwide silver supplies since the 1970s was used up. Uh, the United States used to be in a, in a gold and silver standard, uh, both metals, and in uh, 64 to 68, the value of silver ended up uh, going up and it became worth more than the half dollar coins in circulation. The government pretty much had to stop backing the US dollar with silver. And when that happens, they basically had huge amount of silver and they just dumped it into the market. And most of that, or a large, very large chunk of that silver ended up being used by the electronics industry. So in the 70s, the 80s, you know, we started having computers, uh, solar panels came in the 90s and 2000s. So about half of that got used up. And if you look at mine production, we are now starting to go into deficit for the first time in quite a while. And typically we have more demand, fiscal demand for silver than there is supply. So I, I see a scenario where silver has just been too cheap for too long and physical supplies are becoming smaller and smaller. The price itself has not reflected that, but I expect the price to uh, jump up and go back you know, to a much higher ratio. When it comes to gold and silver, uh, especially if you look at the gold and silver ratio, you will see that over the last 30 years, it has ping-ponged back and forth between 80 and 50. Right now, we just hit 80 again, which means silver is very cheap. Um, you can get 80 ounces of silver for an ounce of gold. And I, I fully expect that we'll be hitting 50 again at some point in the next three years or so. And it makes a lot of sense for people to buy silver when silver is cheap and uh, switch back into gold when you hit around 50 and, and gold is cheap compared to silver. How many customers have sold precious metals uh, in order to move the funds into cryptocurrencies or do people buy digital coins on top of their precious metal holdings? Um, has there been a reduction in demand for gold and silver lately? I think they're complementary. Uh, as far as demand, what we've seen is that early last year, um, or for the first, let's say, two-thirds of the year last year, we've seen um, much reduced demand for gold and silver. Uh, because a lot of people which might have bought gold and silver have started going into cryptocurrency. So we saw some people sell the gold and going into crypto, but we now throughout the industry said a lot of demand has gone towards crypto instead of gold and silver. Um, we had one customer, for example, who, um, I don't know if you know, but we have a peer-to-peer -peer lending system. In other words, if you have gold with us, you can get a loan for about 3% from another customer using your gold as collateral. And uh, we had customers who didn't sell the gold, but they used the gold to get a 3% loan and they bought um, about one half million dollars worth of Bitcoin uh, back in those 600. And, and you know, then of course they did very, very well. And now they are moving back some of those gains back into physical gold. So. What we essentially have seen is in the first two thirds of last year, there was a definite trend towards cryptocurrency and to some degree away from gold and silver. And starting in November or so of last year, we've seen a lot of people going into uh, back into gold. As a matter of fact, right now, around 70% of the sales that we are having are in Bitcoin. You're now offering a new service with cryptocurrencies. Tell us about how that came to be. Yeah, essentially, we we had one customer who, who sold about nearly half a million dollars worth of bullion in order to buy Bitcoin. And and we've been doing, we've been allowing go, buying and selling uh, of gold and silver in Bitcoin for around two years. 
But uh, what happened is that this customer was not very, very literate with, with computers. Uh, it was an older gentleman. And, you know, when we asked him, where do you want the, the bitcoins to be sent? You know, he, he said, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, so we are starting to get a little bit nervous because, uh, as you would know, if, uh, when you have bitcoins, oftentimes you need to you need to know your private key and you need to keep that uh, quite secret. Whoever has your private key, uh, you, you know, can basically steal your bitcoin. So we kind of realized that there is a big need uh, for a service to store bitcoins, and of course you can store it in many different ways. Um, but what we specialize in is in creating a very safe type of storage. And when you build a storage system, you basically have three characteristics uh, that you can work towards. Um, reliability, security, and convenience. And you can only choose two of these. So you can make a very reliable and safe system, but by default, it's not going to be very convenient because things that make it convenient makes it less secure and vice versa. So we basically went on the drawing board and um, my background is I, I used to be a uh, senior data architect for major banks. So my whole life I've been spending in, in software development. And we basically looked at how can we store crypto in a way that addresses all the major security problems. So what we ended up doing is basically create a um, uh, user vault management system, which is an offline system, to create a physical key uh, in memory. We immediately encrypt it, and then we use a laser to create um, a polycarbonate uh, card with the encrypted private key on the card. Uh, we're actually creating two cards. One is a main card, one is a backup card using a different encryption system. And these cards then go into a safe deposit box and are stored along with the gold. Now, the reason we do all of this is because we never store the key on, in any digital format. And now because it's not stored on any computer, it cannot be hacked. It, it's a very clear way of, of storing it and useless because it's encrypted. And in order to decrypt it, you need to have a special decryptor device but even if you steal the decrypted device, it's still useless because the code for decrypting it is in the vault management system and you need three people to actually sign in uh, to retrieve that code. So we have a lot of um, checks and balances inside the system. And because we have that, uh, we are probably one of the first entities in the Bitcoin storage uh, arena to be able to get insurance. So. Um, right now, we have about $300 million worth of insurance for gold and silver. And uh, within two weeks or so, we should be able to get our uh, Bitcoin insurance as well. And normally, insurers are not willing to do that because they can't really assess the risk of having Bitcoins on a computer. It's just too much of a black box. But because we store it just like gold and silver and we make it physical, you know, we can get that. So essentially, the storage system allows you to store, you know, two, three, four, five, twenty, a hundred million dollars in a way uh, which is very, very safe. You can get third party insurance on it. And it addresses one need which a lot of crypto owners have, which is what happens if the owner gets hit by a bus. Because oftentimes if they have their um, private key, uh, you know, a mnemonic a hardware wallet and they have the mnemonic phrase memorized or something like this, if something happens, you might not be able to recover it. So uh, that's one advantage we bring. And uh, in about two or three months or so, um, people who store crypto with us will be able to use it as collateral on a peer-to-peer -peer lending system, which basically allows you to get loans uh, against it as well, uh, which I believe will be quite popular for, for crypto uh, holders. So that's essentially the storage system. Uh, we have a video which kind of shows the lasers riding it and sort of describes it, uh, which is a pretty good summary of what it of what it does. There's also a 37-page white paper uh, for those people who are interested in all the minute details of how the system works. And we will be publishing the source code of how the keys and so on are created um, publicly as well. So. We are kind of following the best practices of cryptocurrency and, and makes the system very transparent. 
Gregor, please share with people uh, your website. Uh, yes, the, the main website is silverbullion.com.sg. And uh, our storage facility, where the video is, that is uh, safehouse.sg. And uh, that, that, that's where we have the videos, that's where we have the, the white paper. The system is not quite ready yet. We'll probably need two or three more weeks. Uh, we are in the final testing stages now, uh, but it will be coming soon. I'm just going to say that one, one thing that crypto owners can do with the system as well, they can basically almost instantaneously switch into gold, physical gold, um, or from gold back into cryptocurrency. So uh, oftentimes when you store cryptocurrency, you have the problem of, you know, how do you go back into fiat? We are basically saying, well, don't go back into fiat, go into physical gold instead. Gregor, thanks for being here and sharing with us these interesting insights and services. Yep, you're welcome.